And we are live. Uh, I'm speechless because we're live. <laughs> I said a little <laughs> moment. Coach Holly uh, is hanging out with me today, and uh, it is super fun to have you on, Holly. Glad to be here. Yeah, especially as Holly is uh, radioing in from a place that is not San Francisco. We'll talk more about that sure. a little bit later. Uh, I can see you guys responding and typing questions in in comments, which is perfect. We are going to get to a ton of your questions today about running, dealing with injuries, and you know, talking in general about like how do we how do we train and motivate ourselves for races that may or may not happen this fall. Um, but we wanted to just remind you that we have also just launched a brand new program in our app called the Injured Runner Program. It is searchable by body part. Um, it is broken down into key the key daily strength and mobility accessory movements you should be doing to get yourself back. It's broken down by level of injury, and it is designed to be super helpful. More on that later, but you can access this as part of our YouTube community um, with a special deal. And we have this open between now and Wednesday, uh, June 24th, where you click the link uh, in the description of this video and you can become an annual premium member to the Run Experience for 99 bucks, normally $119.99. We'd love to get you in there using that program as well as all of our other great stuff. So we'll talk about that more later. But uh, first of all, um, Holly, where are you chiming in from today? <laughs> I am chiming in from Nashville, Tennessee. Nashville, New home. Tennessee. New home. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. We like to think that TRE is expanding. Guys, that's where we're going. <laughs> We got, um, Across the US. exactly. Um, and you've been out there for three weeks now. Yeah. This yeah. Sunday is three weeks. Oh mm -hmm. man. So what, what have been some of the, the highlights so far? Honestly, just like meeting a ton of people right away. Um, it's been cool to just like kind of throw yourself in. I only knew two people when I moved here and just, it's good to come with your own interests and like things that you already like, but I'm already like learning about what people here do and like, mm things that are popular in the summer and stuff like that. So it's just been cool to just jump into whatever everyone's doing. Yeah, that is that is really cool. And just new weather, new routines, new everything. New, yeah, what is that like? Because I don't know if you guys know this, but like the Bay Area, like <laughs> I grew up in New England and mosquitoes are a thing. And you had to have a screen in porch. You had to have citronella candles. You just had to have bug spray all the time. And it's like minus a few flies, like – we live in like, at least there's in where I'm in, the there's nothing. It's like bug free and pretty <laughs> much humidity free too. And you, you now have not. plenty of bugs. <laughs> yeah. I, it's like things that I don't think about. Like when I go running here, I don't think about the bugs. And then I come back with like eight mosquito bites. Um, and the humidity is just an entirely different training element that I haven't had to deal with in a long time. So, you know. Getting it, adjusting to the the heat and and different type of heat as well. Um, exactly. That's always surprising because I always remember like growing up in. I mean, you grew up in Virginia, um, mm -hmm. so you're kind of used to that humidity as well. But I remember, yeah. yeah, summer days it it might not be over eighty or eighty five, but the humidity was so high you're just like, like baking. Thick. Yeah. It's just like yeah. soupy. And here it could yeah. be ninety five or hundred degrees, but it's so dry it doesn't. It doesn't hurt as much Affect or nearly as, as much. much. Yeah, yeah, that is true. Um, yeah, so so Nashville and, you know, we want to talk about a few different things here and we're going to get into your guys' questions, but one of the themes of today's show, uh, ladies and gents, is running and training with injuries and how we battle them. Um, you guys aren't the only ones to deal with them. Uh, we as coaches deal with them too. And... Uh, I wanted to talk to Holly a little bit about a hip injury that she was dealing with a little bit this spring. And if you mm -hmm. watched some of her videos, especially training for the LA half marathon that unfortunately never was able to happen, you know, that was part of the process. So yeah, why don't we, why don't we start there, Holly? Like, how are you doing with the hip injury right now? And, and you know, what's been working for you? Yeah. So, um, if you guys had been following, I, in January, kind of had this hip flexor flare up. 
Um, and I went to see a few different people about it. It was like super sudden. It wasn't one event that caused it. I just kind of stood up one day and it was like really painful to even walk. So everything that I kind of discovered was that my like psoas and iliacus, which is like your deep core muscles, mine were extremely tight and perhaps even weak. And I really wasn't like focusing on them at all. So started to loosen those up, which helped a lot. It took some like pressure off the hip flexor. And then I started just doing a ton of glute work and strength around my glute medius, which turns out were also extremely mm. weak. Um, so, so this is interesting because you have been working out in a gym regularly and oh yeah. are strong, right? And it's like <laughs> you can, uh, let's say our one max one rep max squats were probably the same. You're probably a little bit ahead of mine, <laughs> but so you were very very strong. So how can you be squatting so much and still have these issues? So what I realized is it's one thing to be strong in the movements you always do. If you don't understand why you're doing them, there's a big problem with the disconnect there, um, which is why I really like kind of the way that we've built our training for you guys is because it's hard to draw that line sometimes. And like for me, I knew I could like lift this much or I could squat this much, but if I don't understand how that's helping my running and supporting mm. my steps over a bunch of miles, like it, it doesn't make sense. And so what I realized is parts of my hips and glutes were strong, but the medius, which were not, which does a huge part of stabilizing the hips in general, wasn't working or functioning. So it ended up that the front of my hips were doing everything. Mm. Um, and I was just smoked all the time. And so it's, it's kind of funny. Like now I actually feel so much stronger and better and more well-rounded because I s spent so much time on this alone. Like I barely noticed the hip now, which I'm super grateful for. That's awesome. I mean, we're six months in, but yeah. So that's a really important point about injuries and strengthening muscles or whatever to, to improve ourselves. It's sometimes I think that you know, when we think of strength training and we just focus on like, oh, I need to activate this or that muscle, it almost feels like a paint by number situation where I just mm -hmm. have to kind of color in the lines. But as you said, you know, that doesn't necessarily teach you how to move in a way where these muscles are doing their job while you're actually running. Exactly. Right. Yeah. And so basic movement patterns, like you practice picking your foot up using that muscle that you just got strong and doing that is so different than just like, I'm going to go do like a strength circuit and hope that it pays off in my running. It, you have to know why those things cross. Um, and if you don't like you will get hurt because you're not aware of like what's doing the job for you. Yeah. So what were some of the exercises that you did? Cause you were starting to do some different activation things, but like, how did you, like, when did you do them? Did you do them like every day? Did you do them before your runs or just on your strength days? So I know myself and like, if I say I'm going to do something every single day, that's going to be really overwhelming. And I mm. would almost batch it away. You know, I would almost like do worse at it because I'm like asking so much. So my goal was two to three times a week, I would spend a full hour uh, just with my hip circle band. And I would do some exercises I got from a PT, like really basic stand on one leg, press against the band, some clamshells, my adductors, it turns out, are really weak. So my inner thighs, I was mm -hmm. doing like side planks with my top leg on there. And I would just dedicate this 45 minutes to an hour, two to three days a week. And I noticed like the weeks that I did it mm. were so different in my running from the others. So yes. I, I watched it pay off. Yeah. So more like single leg work and more leg where you're sort of like being loaded rotationally or laterally to just strengthen yep. and activate and stabilize some of those things. Uh, yeah. You know, that's great. I think uh, Michael Hamilton said in the comments, wow, Holly, thanks for sharing that. I'm going through the exact same thing after being uh, distracted by a false um, FAI, which is a femoral acetabular impingement diagnosis. And oh. your one side was weak while the other was active. Uh, horrible cycle of pain. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it was, it was painful. I'm sorry you're going through that. Um, I'm on the other end, hopefully, knock on wood. Uh, but I'm stick with it. Just, just stay on top of your exercises because there's a reason you're doing them and you need to teach yourself how to run now using what you have gotten from them. Yeah. You know, and Rachel brings up a good point. She says, Hey, glute meds seem to play into a lot of injuries. I know that was an area I had to start strengthening when I was healing. 
the IT band issue, it does seem a lot of injuries just go right to the hips in back some way. All yep. roads go back there. Um, you know, I remember one of the things that you mentioned when this first came out back in January was, if I have this correct, was you were home, you were sitting down more or just like, you know, like it's a nice time of year to be with family and to not to be out of regular routines. You're not in your regular fitness routine and you came back and it became a bit of a hot spot. Is that accurate? Yeah, I, yeah, totally. I think um, what happened was I just, I don't sit a lot generally for my work and like my Mm. daily life. And I went to like a full week at Christmas of just, (laughs) I was working out, but when I wasn't working out, I was just seated, like Mm. watching sports with the family or just watching movies or just, you know, hanging and like, I think I just didn't pay attention and was just super folded up. And I went on a very long run uh, with my dad on like a couple days after Christmas. And I think that just set everything off because I wasn't in the body I'm used to having um, right when I go for that run. So I, I could have probably mobilized a lot more before mm. and not have jumped in as cold. So, But it's interesting, right? It's just how sometimes those sort of changes, you know, set things off. Uh I know right now with the last couple of months being what they've been, um, I know a lot of people's schedules are off and who knows, yeah. maybe people not in an office are able to walk around, be more mobile at home, or maybe people, mm-hmm. they're not moving around as much because they are stuck at home and they end up being seated a little bit. Um, mm-hmm. Where do you feel about, so running right now feels pretty good. It feels pretty pain-free. Yeah, um, I am way more on top of my warm up cool down. Like I always did that, but now I like make it specific to exercises I started using to heal this thing because I, I just realized they really are good at activating the parts that weren't before. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, I really I feel good. Mm, that's I, good. I'm happy to say that. I at one point never thought I'd say that again. Yeah, for sure. Well, yeah. let's let's dig in. We got more things we want to talk about and go back and forth on, but let's dig into some of the comments and questions because we are here for you guys. That is what this whole show is about. We love that there's almost 187 of you guys on this live show. How about them apples? Um, <laughs> Sam, who has been following us for forever, says, always great hang with TRE community. It's hot. Should we slow the pace to prevent heat exhaustion or use it to develop high tolerance? You're in a new place. What are you What are you doing, Holly? <laughs> so I, when I went for my first run, when I got here, I was like, I'm going to start super conservative and short to feel it out. Um, because what I didn't want to do was plan on this big, long run, because I'm going to have to really build mileage soon. And I took my water with me and everything. And I just started slow and just got a sense of what my body was like feeling in the humidity yeah. and heat. Because like Nate said, in the Bay Area, it's like, you have a perfect breeze all the time beautiful views. I mean, you don't even have to think about what your body temperature is at a lot of the time. And so here I just started in a way that I knew I'd feel confident and strong. And then if I felt okay to continue and go a little faster, I would. So that the second run I added on some miles and then knew how I was going to adapt. But now it's super important to add in salt and electrolyte Mm -hmm. every run almost in this heat. Whereas like Bay Area, I'd probably get away with that. You could get away with it. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. You know, in my uh, triathlon days, uh, when I cared about events like Kona Ironman World Championships, um, not to say I don't care about it now, but when I was really focused on it, you know, being able to show up in Hawaii in October to perform was a challenge because it's tropical environment, it's humidity is high, and it's warm. And Mm -hmm. the crazy thing about an Ironman race is you're running your marathon in the peak heat of the day. If you're fast, you start running at noon. If you're a little slower, you may start at 2 or 3 p.m. And, like, (laughs) that's hot. And you've also done all this other activity, so you're incredibly depleted already. Um, A lot of athletes would go out, try a week or two weeks ahead of time just to adapt. And a lot of times Mm -hmm. the process is pretty natural. Your body actually learns to not uh, sweat out as much sodium. Um, and, and literally just sweat out water and kind of hold on mm-hmm. to the electrolytes. That's part of the adaptation process. And that just comes with time. The workouts don't have to be hard, just slow and yeah. steady and easy when you're out there and you'll, you'll definitely get better. But I do like your points about, yeah, you gotta be, 
really good about your hydration going into those runs before and after. And you might be okay for a day or two, but it's sort of like sleep. You can like, yeah. if you can like get behind and then you can't just make it up in a day. Like it takes a while exactly. to get back in. Yeah. And I think the point about like, do you push yourself to build out? I don't know if you use the word tolerance or um, just kind of increase your strength in the heat. Mm. But once you feel like you understand what your body does. So if I'm like cramping a lot or I realize like I get super lightheaded or whatever, I slow down to a pace I can control. And then from there, like, yeah, the goal is to be able to be running your best at any temperature and know yourself well enough to do that. So, um, right. I'm new in this heat humidity right now, but mm. once I feel comfortable, like I am going to push it because if I don't now, um, if I do any races in this type of area or temperature or whatever, like I won't be ready for it if I'm not going to push myself in that same condition. Yeah. I think that's a good point. I think that, you know, once we get that level of adaptation, then it's like, okay, how do we figure out how we can last longer in these environments? And there probably is a mental component to it, just being comfortable uh, in those conditions and then being better able to adapt in those situations because you could be lazy about your fueling and hydration on a normal run and be like, ah, I ran for, I mean, it could be cool out here where I could run for 90 minutes or two hours and maybe not bring any water. But on another day with different temperature, like that's a really bad idea. I'm going to really yeah. pay for that at the, the rest of the time. Um, what else do we got here in the comments? Um, Sharon says, I think people who run in the freezing cold are nuts. It needs to be at least 45 <laughs> for me. Um, Michael says, we're enjoying a very mild June so far in North Carolina. In another month, the heat will be a huge factor for sure. Um, ooh, B. LeQuang says, do you have a program to return from injury or do we start over with the 30-day challenge? We do have a program to return for injury. And uh, one of the things, we guys, we just released is something called the Injured Runner Program. And... We want to get into it a little bit. Um, and Holly has a, has a kind of a great mindset that we sort of started with when we, we created this program. But uh, yeah, why don't, we, why don't we start with that? Yeah, um, we were super excited about this program for a lot of reasons. But we made it, you know, thinking of you guys as like, all you know is your knee hurts or you got back from a run and your ankle hurts. You don't know why um, it didn't yesterday or it did the last two days, whatever. And you don't really know much beyond that because you never had to. So we made this program, separated everything out by body part, very straightforward. You go to the area that's hurt. Um, we've al already taken the guesswork out though, because we know that a knee injury usually came from something else, mm. uh, weakness somewhere else. Like I was saying with the hip, or a tightness somewhere else that you're just kind of building these habits around and which is why it got kind of hurt in the first place. And then we tiered um, the program based on the level of injury, like how hurt you are, what can you do? Uh, so Nate did a really good job with like bringing cross training in and keeping those sessions there for you guys. And so I, I love this program. I think it's like very much needed. And I would say it's like what our strength is as, as a company and a training program is knowing how to diagnose and get you still moving through the injury. Cause there's nothing worse than being told. Like I went to doctors for my hip that said, you know, take uh, six to eight weeks off. Right. Well, like we'll see you then. And I'm just like, that's not an option. Uh, which I know a lot of you guys feel that same way. Yeah, it's hard. I think that when we're dealing with an injury and our only options are to rest and ice or to ignore it, you know, we're going to ignore it until we, we can't anymore. And I've definitely gone down that road a bunch. Um, you know, we started, for those of you guys who have seen it, we started with the Injury Prevention Series, which, which was just sort of like a resource library of, of videos to like, hey, if I have something with a knee, what, what are like a couple mobility things I could do? But it didn't, it wasn't very prescriptive. And so mm -hmm. the next thing we wanted to do was help you guys with specific programming all the way through. And that's what a lot of our videos do on, on YouTube. Like you guys mm -hmm. have to figure out if my knee hurts right now, um, I need to assess how injured is it? Uh, am mm -hmm. I able to run? Uh, can I run only a little bit? Uh, can I run 30 minutes pain-free and that way I've got a little more leeway or should I stop running altogether? 
but still be doing some other activities. And like, let's mm-hmm. talk about knees. Like, why would your knee be dealing with pain? Oftentimes, it's actually not what's going on with the joint itself. It could be really tight uh, tissue and fascial layers above or below the knee. So a big culprit with knee pain is your quads are super stiff and super tight. So how do we get you on a thing where you're regularly rolling out and smashing your quads and improving it? And then as well as we got to look at your range of motion. Maybe your hips are really tight, which is leading you to overstride. And every time you overstride, your your heel smashes in the ground a little bit harder and that knee takes that impact. So how do we improve your hip range of motion so you get better extension out the back, your leg doesn't swing as far forward, and all of a sudden you can land lighter on your feet. So it's like, mm-hmm. how do we like stitch these things together and then sort of roll it out progressively? Um, yeah, and I think the other thing that we separated it as, so we all the body parts are separated, <clears throat> and then we talk about um, strength for that area, mobility for that area, like getting the stretch in, and then cross training that you can do relative to your injury. Uh, so it's once you start getting in there and you figure out um, how we built it, um, which we're even making more clear each day, but it's a really nice way to create your own training program based around your injury. If you were in one of our programs, we even reference how you can keep doing that, uh, just subbing things in. And you'll come out the other side knowing your body way better than I would say 70% of the runners out there, honestly. Yeah. One of the biggest pieces of advice that I am always giving runners, it shows up in my videos a lot, is that we can't wait until we get, like, for number one, injuries don't come out of nowhere unless you, you know, (laughs) trip and pothole and fall, (laughs) you know, taxi cab clips you or something like you're in a city, you know, most of the time we've like accepted this low level of pain and it just builds up. Mm -hmm. And then we're really surprised when all of a sudden it's taken us out. Mm -hmm. And what we're sort of surprised by is, is really our lack of awareness of what was really going on. And so much of us is like with, we're running, you know, a lot of us are trying to run to get in shape, especially now to burn off a little stress, to feel good in our bodies. Push yourself. Yeah, but like if our body is not fit enough to handle that running, there's going to be a breakdown. And this is not to say, hey, if you're not fit, you shouldn't run. It's just I just need to know where I'm at so that I can meet my training at the right spot because the training that your buddy's doing may not be right for you because your body's right. not ready for it yet. Um, and I do want to say something for me was like <clears throat> it's really easy to think that if you're a good runner, you won't get hurt. And if you're a beginner runner, you are more likely to get hurt. For me, what I realized is we all have our own habits and we Mm. have day jobs and we move in certain ways as a result of how we sit or do other things, or we're tired at certain points of the day. And if we work out like that, we're maybe not in our best form. So it's, this is a cycle that happens to everybody. Um, Like Nate was saying, like, I get my strength work in, I stretch all the time. I was honestly shocked that I was dealing with this big of an injury. And what it just made me realize is that the more hyper aware you are day to day, the less intense that injury will be Mm -hmm. when something breaks. Like it won't be, it's just part of the cycle, you know, just don't panic about it. Um, but just be aware when those little things flare up, fix that then. And so that you don't have to deal with this long, you know, doctor's visits and all that stuff. Yeah. I think, I think those daily check-ins give you a really good baseline of where your body's at. And you can catch things and make better decisions. Like, you know what? Ooh, maybe I'm, I'm a little stiffer and, and painful to the touch after today's hard session. Maybe I should back off tomorrow and not, not run. Um, versus like, oh, I'm just going to ignore and then wait for, for something to, to blow up. So if, exactly. <laughs> if you have blown up a little bit, you're not alone. I have blown up. Mm-hmm. I've crashed and burned multiple times. Um, but that's why we sort of created those videos and you can find a lot of these things on our YouTube channel guys just by searching, but we put all of this in one place in injured runner program, which is why we're so excited to, to share, share it with you guys. And, uh, again, there's a description, there's a link in the description of this video where you can join, become a premium annual member for the run experience for 99 bucks. That is a screaming deal. You get all of our race programs, our challenges, all of our at-home workouts. We're cranking out audio workouts right now. 
I've become very friendly with this guy right here, which has been a whole lot of fun uh, to, to do. And, uh, you know, you can join our community. So we would love to see you in there. So um, we have a lot more questions around injuries and shin splints. Let's take a few more. And then what I want to talk about is, you know, training for fall races that, that may or may not happen <laughs> as, as we're starting to go through. Uh, there's been a, a little thread on shin splints, um, which has been really big. Um, I'm trying to see if I could find it. Was it, it's not Fred, he's talking about hydration. Um, oh, um, Mariah, I think Yeah, it is. there uh, we go, yep. Yeah, talking about um, doing ABCs with her uh, ankle every night before going to bed and run on softer ground. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the conversation basically in the comments is about shin splints and what you can do for them. I would say this is one of the most common first injuries we see mm -hmm. a lot of beginner runners have. And I mean, you take thousands of steps in one run and you think about how much impact that can be over time. And if you're not focused on your landings or understand why you should land a certain way, uh, it's very easy for like hard cement or a hard surface to just pound you. Um, the good news about shin splints is that it's usually a result of things being tight from the get go, which when she's talking about doing ABCs, like physically drawing ABCs with your feet, it keeps your range of motion larger in the ankle so that you have more range, which kind of mitigates that impact when you're hitting the ground mm -hmm. because you have bigger angles to work with. There's more to work with. It's not the same pound every single time, meaning the shins themselves and then the calves can do more for you in a greater range of motion, which would then not cause that over tension in the shins. Totally. You know, like your, your ankle, it needs to dorsiflex, it needs to plantar flex. It needs to evert and invert and supinate and pronate and rotate. All this crazy stuff, right, that our ankle mm -hmm. is responsible to do because, you know, you're an all-terrain vehicle. Like, imagine if <laughs> every time you stepped on a root or an uneven surface, you just, like, broke. <laughs> it's <laughs> like you just fell over. Like, we're meant to go over shoddy terrain, up and down steps, slippery surfaces all the time. And for us to be able to really navigate that efficiently, we need an ankle that is this really strong all-terrain vehicle that can just handle all this force in action. Yeah. And mm -hmm. most of the time, our day-to-day -day doesn't really challenge us in that way. We live in flat, even terrain. And we're not really loading our our ankles or our shins that much. So when we start to mm -hmm. run, that's like the first time we're getting that experience. And while our cardiovascular system is like, hey, I like this. This is great. Our ankles are like, what the hell's happening? Like I'm just, <laughs> I'm not ready. So to Holly's point, adding extra movement helps get blood flow in there. It helps kind of activate all of those lower leg muscles, um, your anterior and posterior tibialis your gastroc and your soleus and just even some of the smaller muscles and tendons around your foot to strengthen. And especially for those of you guys who are dealing with foot, ankle, Achilles issues, like tendons don't get a lot of blood flow. So exactly. doing things to bring blood flow in is big. And that's where you get a lacrosse ball or a foam roller and you start to roll out. And this is why icing alone guys doesn't necessarily work very well. Um, and well, if, the th mm -hmm. I was going to say one of the things that I really like with the lacrosse ball is we've talked about this. We call it like the, we call it a sandwich or something, but you get two lacrosse balls on either side. Your, your lower leg is just mm -hmm. seated on this bottom one, top one's up here. And then I'll just do like ankle circles to get the blood flowing and everything around the calf, the sides of the shin. And mm -hmm. it's, it's incredible because one, you're working in that range of motion, but two, like blood is just pumping. So especially if you do this after a run, uh, that's one of the biggest reasons people see shin splints is like maybe you stretched before, but if you get back and you hop on the couch and you're cold, mm. it's locked up again. Like you're not repairing anything. Like blood flow is a big part of why you're going to repair and come back stronger. And if you're not getting that to the area right when you get back, uh, you end up seeing kind of negative over time and the shin splints kind of show up. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. You know, Alicia, Alicia here says, you know, asked about compression socks. And, you know, the way I would think about compression socks is like, 
solving major nutritional issues with supplements versus my diet, like the foods I'm putting in my body and how I'm eating. And so much of the self-care that we talk about on this channel, that's also in our programs, that's also in the Injured Runner program, is the diet. How do you put better foods in your body? In this case, it's how do you put better movements in your body on a mm -hmm. regular basis mm -hmm. so that you're improving your ankle range, you're strengthening your range, you're understanding where your limits are, and then you're understanding how that feeds back into things like running. And I think, do you wear compression socks, Holly, or any of those tools? I actually, I don't, but I, you know, I love the Norma Tech boots after a run, so I'll do compression specifically after, but I, I don't run in compression socks. I've thought about it. Do you ever, um, have you ever like flied with it, flown with it or? Mm -mm. Uh, I, like voodoo floss is the most I felt, but no. Yeah. Yeah. For compression. I like voodoo floss as well. Yeah. Um, you know, I think they're a cool tool, but I just, I put them in the same category as like, you know, beet powder and, uh, <laughs> you know, or, or like a squat, like a, a, a belt to wear for lifting. It's like, that doesn't teach me how to be better at squatting, right? It, it can support me when I'm doing all these other things. So it, we always say this, but if, if it makes you feel better um, and it's something that works in your routine, that's awesome. Just understand that it, that is not the fix for getting that range or preventing the problem next time if you just rely on the one product. Uh, so as long as you understand how it fits into everything yeah. else, then by all means, if you feel good, do it. Yeah. Now, let's go back to like your hip injury a little bit and the process that you came out of it because – you were, your hip was bothering you to a point where you kind of had to stop running, but it didn't mean that you stopped training. And I know that right. kind of to your other point is like, my knee hurts, what do I do? And a lot of people are like, well, do I stop or do I ignore it? And some mm -hmm. people do stop and they're like, hey, I've done nothing for two or three weeks. How do I know when I'm ready to get back running again and get back moving again? How did you deal with that with your hip? So one of the ways I navigated it was I knew I had races I cared about coming up. That was like a huge priority for me. So the half marathon that was supposed to be in April and then the hundred miler um, in October. And I started with like day to day, how do I feel when I'm like working with clients and training them and when I'm just on my feet and whatever, like what's the pain scale? If I felt like it wasn't getting worse, like in one week period, like it wasn't getting worse, um, I would just... I'm a big, like, I still need the time dedicated to the training. So even if it's like way less intense, I need to be spending that time. So like, it's still mm -hmm. be an hour, or whatever longer, um, in the day, but I'm making sure it's still happening. So it feels like I'm on a training schedule, mm -hmm. even if I'm not say I was supposed to do a 10 mile run, even if I'm not going to do that, that day I'm doing something that feels like it's adding to the training. Yeah. So Cause mentally for me, if I feel like I'm stopping mm -hmm. or like, I'm going to wait until I'm ready, like that's that's going to just screw me up. Interesting. So yeah, so rather than the all or nothing, you're like, okay, I've dedicated this time to train to improve my body and I wanted to run. Running right now is off the table. What what can I do instead or how can I kind of modify the run? Um, mm -hmm. How did your warm-ups change with your hip? Because I know you're someone who who regularly warms up anyway, but what, what were some things there that, that may have changed or you realized? So I grew up dancing my whole life. Um, so I've explained that in some videos, but I always took for granted uh, the flexibility point. So when I do warm up, I'm kind of like, well, I'm, I'm stretching and I feel ready to go, but my body is kind of like more stretched out to begin with anyway. My warm ups changed significantly. Um, we did a track video, if you guys saw it, and the drills alone have been a game changer for me because it gets me working quickly before, even if I'm going to go do a long, slow run up some hills, like if I can get some high knees, butt kicks, side shuffles in before I know that everything is like going to work quickly mm. and therefore could then be slowed down, you know, based on my choice. If you don't warm up and you go just out, you know, and take the first mile to just kind of feel it out and see how you're feeling, you're almost delayed from the beginning if you wanted to go faster, you kind of couldn't even feel what mm. engaging that quickly would be. So that's why I love a high knee in place. Um, I just feel like everything gets activated mm. and I know I'm, I'm really sharp from the beginning. Um, so that changed like drills. I never really did. I would do a bunch of dynamic stretching, but I wouldn't, you know, high power through like 
10 minutes of drills. And now I feel like that has changed it. Interesting. So, so you were doing some dynamic stretching before, but like some running in place drills seem to really help. And yeah, so you did totally. high knees. What else did you do? If anyone saw my attempt at the, was it B-skips? A-skips and B-skips. <laughs> I hope those videos don't resurface, but, um, the, like, so skips in general are really good for distance and for height. Um, mm -hmm. What I love, drills get you working in like big range of motion, um, you know, high power activities that you're going to then make smaller, you know, for the run. So I would just practice like bounding um, strides where I'd go slow for, you know, five seconds build speed for like 20 to 30. Um, it, it's great too. Heart rate comes up by the time I'm like into the middle of the run, I'm like cruising. I, I feel like mm. already sweaty and ready to go and a lot more stable. And I'm not waiting for that like initial spike. So that was like a big thing. Also, I noticed like my left side with that hip injury, it was just moving slower than the right. So yeah. I would do those high knees and stuff. It wouldn't come up as high. Like I would be aware of that before I even went out for the run, which was important. You know, I, I think like neuromuscularly when we're dealing with a pain point, our body like diverts power from that area and tries to <laughs> channel it elsewhere. So it's like, oh, if your hip bothers yeah. it. Ooh, like we're just not going to try to move it as much. And this is where we get into crazy compensation is issues. So a lot of you guys who've dealt with an injury, like you might start limping or favoring something else. And all depending what you're doing, that, <laughs> that can cause other issues because all of a sudden this other body part is being overloaded. So it's you have to meet this at the right time because there are times where it's like you don't want to poke. You don't want to poke an angry bear. <laughs> you want to leave him alone. Yeah. Um, but, um, there are times when it's dealing a little pain in your tail that you actually want to like meet it head on. So for me, I've dealt with, um, it's not Achilles, but it's like Achilles like pain where mm -hmm. the best course for me is actually to do like a bunch of single leg hopping and calf raises like before I run yep. or right after. And yep. that purposely like kind of turns it on and mm -hmm. helps me, you know feel much better, which I really like. Um, yeah. And if, if you guys, um, it's so like, it's so tempting for all of us to skip the warm up, shorten the warm up. Like I want to run for longer. We're all guilty of it. All I'll say is that it is, it is definitely something that makes the running better and honestly feel better too. You're way better off adding those five minutes into the warm up slash cool down, uh, than just slogging for those extra five mm. minutes in the run you'll get more out of it and you'll get faster and stronger, you know, progressively as you keep doing that same thing. You know, one of my favorite things to do as like a go-to and it's almost like brainless. If I'm in the middle of a run, uh, I think some of you guys have pointed this out. It might've been Kelly in the comments who said, Oh, like I found that I did like high knees and butt kicks from one of Holly's videos in the middle of her long run. She's tired. It really helps is, you know, to, to use those drills, not as something you're like, I should do, but mm -hmm. things that can literally wake you up. It's like yeah. splashing cold water on your face, you know, for your body. And it's like, take the middle of your run and take five minutes and do a drill for 20 to 30 seconds and then run easy for 30 seconds. And yeah. you could do five rounds. It could be one drill. You could alternate two. It almost doesn't matter what it is. But just that little like 30 on, 30 off for a couple minutes yeah. is, is like, huge. Yeah. Yeah, and it's also a great way to be like, you know, I don't have more time to work on these things, but how can I inject this on the time that I'm already working exactly. on for sure? Um, interesting. So one of the this is kind of an interesting question. Um, this is from Renz82. What are the best shoes for duck feet? I tried <laughs> Nikes and I had a lot of pain. <laughs> You did a video on duck feet. I did do. I am like duck feet mascot. This goes back to my ballet uh, <laughs> roots. Would you say there's a shoe for duck feet? Did we talk about shoes in your video? Not really. I think we brought it, we brought it all back to it's a you problem, and I'm saying that in solidarity. <laughs> it's an us problem. You problem, um, not a shoe problem. It's not a shoe problem. Yeah, I, I think – this goes back to how you're sitting. If you're sitting a lot, um, you are automatically going to fall into this tight on the outside of the hips position where the knees flare mm. and 
mix that with ankles that are super tight. Again, you're not working on the dorsiflexion, like getting those circles in and kind of practicing that full range. Uh, you end up just scooped out. Basically, the hips are just tight glutes. They don't really want to move from that position. By default, your um, knees and ankles have to deal with that. So it's kind of this like three-piece chain where if that starts tight, maybe the knees are trying to help get the feet straight as a result. So they kind of bow in mm. um, or knock me in. And then the feet go out to then compensate for that. So it's kind of hard to describe just over video, but watch that video I did on duck feet. I really dove into this and mm -hmm. talked about ways you can practice landing the correct way and starting from the top down. Cause it's not just the feet. It starts much higher up. Yeah. It's a really good point. Um, Ed also asks, how do you feel about heel striking? And the way our feet interacts in the ground is a very delicate thing. Um, the best way I've heard this described is that your feet are at the long end of this kinetic whip that starts at your your middle. Um, think about a baseball player or a boxer, you know, throwing a punch or, or throwing. You know, there's this notion where it goes from kind of core to extremity, right? It all starts here. Well, with running, it's the same thing. We have this hip rotation that occurs and our arms tend to counteract, but when we hit that little hip rotation, that helps that leg whoosh, swing through. And so the way our foot interacts with the ground is a function of our hip range of motion and our ankle range of motion. And things happen so quickly to do things fluid and relaxed. Like we need to have the range of motion in place for our body to do it because otherwise we tend to force things if you don't have the range and you just sort of force it, you know, it things just get weird. If you guys have seen um, like a lot of trail running or trail race photos, even some of the best runners out there on really tricky parts of the terrain, you'll see some of the worst duck feet. And what it is, is it's like the first thing they're going to do to like put the brakes on. I've seen that a lot with like mm -hmm. the knees and ankles just negotiate with each other to try mm -hmm. to put the brakes on. You're going, you know what I mean? On like a, a crazy downhill. Uh, if you guys ever look down on one of those types of runs, you'll see that you, you end up running worse because you're just looking for the safest kind of way to land. That's why it's really nice to practice those duck feet drills and everything when you're on flat, plain road, can see what you're doing. So that in those situations, you'll know, okay, what do I need to do with my hips? Can I trust my inner thighs, my adductors to keep me straight? Mm. You know, and of course, keeping that core on. And then it doesn't become a, you know, you just dealing with the train, but you actually choosing how you want to land even yeah. on the downhill. And after today's live show, you should watch the video that Holly just released earlier today about cadence. cadence. Yeah. yeah. So that'd be a really good one to, to get into. Um, so I want to talk, we could keep going on injuries for days. Uh, but again, guys, <laughs> this is the reason why we built the app. The reason why we built these programs was to help answer these questions for you guys. So rather than just point you to an article or to one video, we wanted to show you guys a place where you could just show up and this would all be laid out and you could just progressively follow and do the daily work and get help because it's hard to do this alone sometimes, right? We, we do better as a team and we want you guys to join our team. Um, but I wanted to talk a little bit about training for fall races. Um, you know, as of now, uh, the London or Boston Marathon has been canceled. Um, they're doing a virtual event. We had a few coaches who were going to be out racing. I was going to be out watching it and supporting it and seeing you guys who are going to be there. Um, I know Ber London has been rescheduled to October. I read something yesterday that they're still trying to, they haven't, they haven't closed it yet. They're still trying to hold on to hope. But it puts us in an interesting situation of training for races that may or may not be happening. And Holly, you have signed up for <laughs> one of your biggest runs yet that you've ever attempted <laughs> to do this fall. What it, What is that? Mm -hmm. I have signed up for the Hovelina 100 in um, Arizona on Halloween weekend. Yeah. Yeah, I did that. <laughs> I, uh, I found out from Morgan who also signed up, um, in August, that race director is going to make the call about if that race is going to happen or not. Um, so we don't know. Mm. We're probably two months out from even knowing what the decision will be. Yeah. 
which is interesting. And a hundred mile race is so long that you can't exactly wait <laughs> two months from now yeah, to start you training. Can't wait, but yeah. You you need to be training now. So in, and I'd love to hear from you guys in the comments as well. Like who signed up for a fall race? Um, how are we, you know, staying motivated? But yeah, what what's it been like? You you've had a lot of new changes. Like you've moved to Nashville. You're running on new routes, new terrains. You're training for this race that may or may not happen in new humid mosquito weather. <laughs> Man, yeah, yeah. I so my whole year when I knew I was doing this move, I knew that when I signed up, this was all going on at the same time. But my thought process was that. I love running. I love strength training. That's always going to be a part of my life. And I think I'm just, you know, you build your plan around what your like real goals are, even if you're like mm. doing a bunch of things at once. So you have that going on for me. There's no downside to building up for this mileage as if I'm going to do this race. Like I want to focus and, um, what better way to get acclimated to the running scene here than to actually go find these routes and have to do it, you know, fairly quickly. Um, I'm actually filming a video uh, right now about running in a new city that I'm going to share with you guys. I'm super excited about it, but it's basically covering all the things you need to know when you're traveling for work or vacation or whatever you move and you don't know what, where to start with the running and like finding a place to go. Um, because I have to go find places that I'm going to go do 20, 30 mile runs uh, frequently, you know, my long runs on the weekend and where am I going to do my short ones and how mm. do I make sure it all feels succinct. So my advice is that even if you, oh, there's so many people with fall races. I up. know. Um, St. George Marathon, uh, Marine Corps. Yeah, I, you know, I just feel like we sign up for these things because we want to prove to ourselves that we can do it. And mm. whether you test that on your own day, say it gets canceled, and whether you're going to go test the marathon yourself or not, it's... I think it's a great way to hold yourself accountable. Why lose an entire year of your training if you are allowed and healthy to be out trying uh, because the race isn't going to happen? You know, like mm. maybe it will make you stronger and maybe you'll actually learn something from your plan. I'm going to change it next year when I sign up for one that is going to happen. Uh, so I'm trying to stay positive right now. It's something that I really want to accomplish. And so I just, yeah. I'm going to keep cranking. So keep training and, and, and really enjoy the process of it. You know, it's so trippy. I think that I remember training for the North Face 50K a couple years ago and just really putting like my entire being into that preparation. I just remember doing, you know, these long weekend runs that just sort of would lay me out for the rest of the day. And, you know, at one level, you could be like, oh, the race got canceled. It's all for nothing. But in California, we've had some interesting race cancellations due to fire. Um, mm -hmm. And it wasn't this last year, but it was the year prior where the North Face Endurance Challenge, a big ultra trail run in the headlands that finishes in San Francisco, they had to call that race off, I mean, probably a week before, maybe two so weeks. So many runners, yeah. Not much. Like, yeah. And, uh, you know, you just sort of feel for people. I think the only solace right now is that if things are getting canceled, they're getting canceled a month or two ahead of time. So it takes some of the immediate sting away, but it also gets us in the headspace of really asking, hey, what is this about? Really? Yeah, why do I do this? Why am I showing up to train for these things? Because it's one day, right? Like, or in my case, it'll be two days. <laughs> Um, that you're doing this big event and it's the, oftentimes it's the one thing that's actually keeping you on track on the days you don't want to get up, you don't want to do it. But if you can build, I think the most badass thing is if you can build that kind of commitment to showing up without that race happening. I mean, that's truly doing it for you. Mm. Uh, the medal is incredible, you know, and the finish line is incredible and knowing, you know, you can say that you check it off your list and everything. Uh, but to show up knowing you don't have an event, I mean, I think that's like the real deal. And especially for people just starting out, I just saw a comment. Um, someone was asking about motivation for like mm -hmm. beginner, beginner runners. I just, the thing that will make you love running is watching yourself show up every day. Like mm -hmm. it, you, like my favorite moments are the runs where I did, I wanted to do anything else, but leave. it was raining or whatever. And I go out and do it and I come back and I'm like, yeah, I I forced myself to do it. I knew it was going to make me stronger. And I, and I got through that tough spot, that tough mm -hmm. moment, which is really what a training plan is for is teaching yourself how to make that regular. 
Yeah. You know, it's funny. I think that we've done such a damn fine job of exercising or, or of engineering all discomfort and inconvenience out of our lives. Uh, we have moving sidewalks. We have cars that pick us up right our phone. We don't even have to hail a taxi cab anymore, which used to be super annoying. Uh, everything is temperature controlled to to actively leave all those things. I don't know anyone who's figured out how to like create an air conditioning suit when they run. Like you're exposed to the elements. Um, you don't. Let me know if you, if you figure that out. <laughs> <laughs> you don't always have someone cheering you on. Um, you know, a lot of times you're you're out there, and and I think spending that time alone and dealing with that discomfort is part of the thing. Like it, I think if we can handle those conditions it makes the rest of our day a little more mild. Be like, oh, I just dealt with that out there. I can mm -hmm. totally handle this. And I like your point about the race only being one day, mm -hmm. right? It's, uh, it is a foundation for a bigger reason and purpose and, and few months of training, but it, it is one day out of 90 plus that you're training. It really is. Uh, we should talk about virtual runs a little bit because I hear mm -hmm. some people talking about virtual runs. Uh, they are, some people are into them. Some people like, I can't motivate for them, etc. cetera. Um, I, I had a race that I was getting ready for this spring. It was supposed to be the Boston uh, Athletic Association 5K, which is this big 5K race they do two days before the Boston Marathon. And I was training hard with some buddies for it. Now, I will say that the, the amount of mental anguish and sacrifice that went into a 5K is probably not the same as a 100 miler, but, you know, it was my goal. Like, I was putting a lot into it, and it doesn't matter the distance you run, you're still a runner, right? It does, you don't have to run a certain distance to, to, you know, be a runner with a capital R. So I was really okay. excited about the 5K, and it got canceled and I basically decided to do my own virtual race. Um, I made a video on it. Um, you guys can search for it. Uh, we published it probably a month or two ago. A month ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but guys. It's I super had, good. I had so much fun doing that. Um, I helped my wife. My wife helped me make a, a bib. And she made a race medal for me out of a soup can lid. And I laid out the course. I talked to my friends, I was going to do it. Um, and I just, I, I kind of had a lot of the same feelings I got from a regular race. Like the night before Holly, like I was nervous going to bed. Yeah. I like the pre-race thing. Like I woke up the next morning, I had all my clothes laid out, like I was going for a race and I don't know. I just tried to picture the race course of the other runners, but just all the preparation leading up to the virtual race was the same as the real race and it was really satisfying i really enjoyed it if you guys haven't seen the video um it's it's awesome because he produced it i mean and really showed you every aspect like when you're chatting with like your friends you know before to get psyched they're giving you their tips um and just treating it like this one really like big moment to perform yeah he did sub 18 just right sub 18 casual um yeah and like i think for a virtual race if you are at least like holding yourself accountable telling people you're going to do it that's one thing if it helps to like make a video or like share some aspect of it even on our community like we would love to see it send it to us like we love seeing stuff like that especially when a time right now where a bunch of people are probably going to be doing the same thing it comes down to did you hit the mark did you do what you said you were going to do not as exciting, you know, without the finish line there, but it's mm -hmm. definitely a way to test and really make the mark and like check that off your list. You did it or you didn't do it. You know? Yeah. And so, you know, I did my, you know, 5k in April and I have still been training. I've got, uh, a, a text, a standing little text group with, uh, Two fellow coaches, you guys know both of them, or some of you do, uh, Michael Zinski and Mario Frioli. And Mario writes a workout for the three of us to do, and we do them every Wednesdays. If you guys want to check out my Strava feed, um, I post them there. He writes them out on a little like handwritten note. 
A lot of times there are intervals, usually nothing longer than a couple minutes per interval, and they're like fast. And this last Wednesday, it was fun. We did a bunch of two and one minute intervals, and I did them through these like neighborhood loops. And then I finished with these like 20 second max effort hill sprints with like a full walk recovery down. So you did eight of those. So it's kind of fun. It's like, it's rare when I'm getting ready for longer races that I would like do that type of work with so much mm -hmm. rest. Yeah, but I feel like it allowed me to like kind of tap into other parts of my running and athleticism that was super fun. So I've been trying to embrace, you know, not having a race to train for to, you know, explore these things. And, you know, it's funny, I, is it, what were you going to say? I, I was just going to say, like, one thing that's cool about that is using the downtime, or not the downtime, but the non-race time to focus on, A, your weaknesses, or B, like, areas that you were scared to try because you know you suck at them compared to others. Like, the perfect example, when I was trying to do that half marathon, the Nike one, um, in April, mm. I always go for, like, long, slow races, this was like, okay, the opportunity found in my lap to really go the opposite direction and like just work on speed. And it was super uncomfortable. But now as a result, right, I feel like I have more things to pull from come other race distances and whatever like goals I'm trying to hit in the future now that I've like gotten out of the comfort mm. zone. Totally. And, and, you know, I think for all of us, like we have, I know I'm a creature habit. I like to regularly do things. And that's such a power for good. Because imagine if we had to, you know, like if every day, I think one of the hard parts with new runners when they're forming a new habit is the mental energy that goes into doing that run mm -hmm. every single time. Okay. Like, yep. I mean, after you commit to that for a few weeks, it gets better. Like I don't mm -hmm. fortunately have to commit that much mental energy to running or training the next day. It's just part of my automatic day. And I'll adjust the day. It won't always be beautiful <laughs> or glorious. A lot of times I'm like, oh, that kind of sucked. But I'm just, it's so baked in, I don't think about it. Um, so I think that for a lot of us, there's there's the benefit there, but also we can become trapped in the habits that we're in. And totally. like, again, picking on myself, sometimes I'll just resort to the same mobility things and I won't be hitting other exercises that would also be beneficial. I, I focus a lot on my hips and ankles. I'm not doing enough on my shoulders or my upper back or thoracic spine. Um, I'll tend to default to the same types of runs, the same efforts. I won't explore, you know, either end. And I think this is a time that we can do all those things. Yeah. And not doing too much too fast, but picking one area like this week I'd like to get hills in and I never get hills in. So just picking one thing that you're going to tackle that week, it's already baking in the back of your brain. So when you go out and do it, there's less to think about rather than like, I'm going to hit these four workouts that I've never done before. Don't overwhelm yourself. Just give yourself opportunity to try new things and, you know, take it a week at a time and it will take the mental edge off a little bit because you'll kind of already have been planning. Um, so it's super in the beginning when you're total beginner like that's a good way to start to get used to different styles of workouts mm. and then when you do one of our programs you'll you'll be a lot more confident and like oh, okay this is a drill day which i've dabbled in but i don't really know but I, I trust that i can do it yeah you know actually a program that i've been recommending for a lot of runners especially those who are used to actually it's great for new runners people getting into it for the first time and it's also great for runners who've been experienced and are used to running more halves and marathons to mix it up is our 5k program you know like remember That's filming like, that yeah. thing like we put oh, so <laughs> much time into the strength and mobility and there's like cool line drills and coordination drills in there we have different levels so we've got new beginner level for runners who need more walk run and basic attention but like that advanced 5k is hard it's intense yeah yeah, you're going to turn the screws. Like you're actually going <laughs> to run fast and and run in uncomfortable zones that when you do go back to your 10K or half a marathon, like you're going to have that speed for sure. No pain, no gain. That's what's on that. Yeah, um, right. Do, we have a, do you want to hit more questions or go into? Well, dude, we got to, let's get one more because we're getting to that time. It's crazy. We've been at this thing for Bye. about an hour, hanging out with you guys on this Friday. Um, yeah, thanks for tuning in. Yeah, what's what's uh, another question you want to hit, Holly? 
so we we had a couple questions about um, music and like hearing yourself mm -hmm. land, uh, kind of the give and take there. Like, I think we both have similar opinions on this, but um, actually in the Cadence video, I kind of talk about this that went out today. Uh, I think music can be a great distraction and like really add to the experience. And if you're brand new, like that's one of the things that carries you, especially on those moments where you just want to think about anything else. Uh, podcasts are great, obviously, because you can kind of focus on the story being told or the conversation going on. Um, but that being said, you don't want to become numb to what's going on with your body. That's another way to kind of like not hear what's going on. Those injuries sneak up because you weren't really listening. Um, and whether that's just pounding the ground and you realize you're landing really heavy, which could be an indication that your foot strike isn't where you want it yet. Uh, mm. or you're just slogging along scuffing and you realize like what needs to change about this so that I don't get injured so that I don't end up with a knee problem or a hip issue or whatever. Uh, so there's benefits to both. I would just say don't heavily rely on the music to carry you, but if it's something that kind of gives you a reason to get out there, definitely use it. hundred percent. I, I, it's interesting. It's like. And this is how things can cut both ways because there have been scientific studies done showing how listening to music can improve endurance performance and time trials with that extra motivation. But to Holly's point also, we also know that if we just are tuning into music all the time, we're also just tuning out of how we're moving and we're running. And it just sort of blunts the feedback we get. And then we just perpetuate potentially some ugly, ugly running habit that doesn't mm -hmm. serve us well. So if I were to, you know, create a little dividing line, what I might say is save the music for some of your faster tempo runs and speed runs. Usually when we're running fast, we are running with better form anyway, because it mm -hmm. sort of automatically happens. And maybe one easy run a week, you don't listen to music, tune out. And, and you know, let your thoughts roll around or just like commit to half and half, you know, listen to a song and then take a break for a couple okay. minutes and then go back and forth. Um, from a safety standpoint, uh, we've worked with these guys in the past, uh, but I happen to love Aftershocks headphones. They like loop over the ear. You can see a lot of the videos. I tend to have them just around my neck. Um, I run with my dog, Coach Nora, a lot. And uh, if I'm not paying attention, like I wasn't this morning, uh, Nora found something very smelly to roll in. And <laughs> normally, Nora and I have an understanding. She's allowed to roll in smelly things up to a certain threshold that is non-offensive to the rest of us in the household. <laughs> and she can roll away. But she crossed the line. And so we had to go home and she got a bath and a full scrub down. So see if I didn't have uh, if I had my head if I had, did not have my headphones in maybe I would have caught it in his tracks but I can hear her but, in all the things she's up to Yeah so definitely use them but ha make it a choice make music a choice it shouldn't be what gets you out the door every single day cuz ultimately it's about you pushing through that run so Totally or watching um, your dog Well guys thank you again for tuning in with us on this Friday afternoon Holly uh Thanks for for jumping in. Uh, we'll have to we'll have yeah, to do this thing a little more a little more regularly. It's fun to connect right now that we're on different yes. coasts. Um, I'm so guys, remember we're doing this deal exclusively for you guys, our YouTube community. You can't get this anywhere else. Uh, there is a purchase link in the description of this video where you can get our annual premium membership for ninety nine bucks. It's a screaming deal. It's an average of like eight twenty five a month. And you have unlimited access starting like immediately of all of our race programs and challenges, nutrition and mental programs, our new injured runner program, our community, like Holly, as you were saying, like our coaches are in there like every day, right? Yeah, uh, we post our runs in there. Um, I talk to most of our runners like within the app, which is really cool. Like we'll comment or respond to questions. And then I love when you guys respond to like our photos and videos. Like I posted something from my first Nashville run. Uh, and you guys were awesome. So it's a it's a really cool place to just talk to everybody, especially when we're a lot of us are isolated right now. Um, it's it's really cool. Um, it really really is. So get in there. Um, we'd love to see it. It's open through now and Wednesday. 
Um, otherwise, if you guys are new to this channel, make sure you subscribe to us. We're putting out new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. If you like this video, hit the thumbs up. That helps more people connect with us and uh, find these videos. And our mission is to help more runners out there. So happy Friday, Holly, virtual cheers, and uh, <laughs> I'll see you guys. Bye, guys.